I am so excited for today's episode because we're gonna make something that I've been dying to try. And you've been dying to see me try, aspic jelly. Hey there, I'm Sola El Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. So it's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? Today, we're gonna make an aspic jelly that has fish tongues and lips suspended in it. This recipe is probably the craziest one we've made yet, which makes me all the happier. The crazier, the better. So we're gonna try the original version alongside the famous, or more like infamous, mid-century version. The first mention of aspic dates back to the 10th century in the earliest known Arabic cookbook called Kitab al-Tabiq by Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq. The book includes a recipe for something called karis, a fish aspic made of fish tongues and fish heads. In medieval times, the peasants started eating it when they discovered that it was not only high in protein, but it helped preserve any food that was cooked inside of it sort of like a medieval refrigerator. Making aspic boils down to the process of boiling animal bones and hooves to make gelatin. The legendary French chef Marie Antoine Carême championed it in the late 1800s, and before long, it was an apex of French cuisine called chaud froid, or hot and cold. At that time, jelly dishes were considered food of the elite. It was cheap and easy to make, but really just took forever. And this was in a time where everything took forever to make, so it must have really taken forever. Anyways. Finally, the breakthrough came in 1897, instant gelatin. It took a minute to catch on, but by the 1950s, instant jello made aspic way easier to make and a popular dinner staple. Now anyone could eat like the rich. Around the 80s, the fad ended, and now we know aspic as the gross jelly stuff our grandparents used to eat. They'd put anything in there, like tuna, peppers, onions, hard boiled eggs, but they didn't use fish tongues or lips, so we got them beat. Now on to the fish head and fish tongue aspic jelly making. I honestly can't wait. Okay, we're gonna start by making a really concentrated and flavorful fish stock using these carp heads. We're using carp because the book said that that's what they would have had. In the book, they called it river carp, but um, here we go, we got a bunch of heads. When we simmer the fish heads, because it has so much connective tissue and collagen, this is like the perfect thing to make a jelly. Because these jellies are pretty much just like, we're extracting the collagen and the gelatin from the bones, so this is where all the bones are, in the heads. Okay, I'm gonna start by putting them in the pot. We gotta get these tongues and lips really nice and tender, because they're gonna be suspended in the jelly. Here we go. So we, we're starting with eight, eight heads, but they would have made this with like hundreds of heads. I think a lot of what they're trying to do is like show off how many fish heads they got their hands on. This is like a pricey thing. You're getting, you're getting a whole fish and you're just using the heads for this. Okay, so this one's my favorite, I've decided. I named him Gus. He looks sassy. He looks sassy and he kind of has an overbite. Reminds me of my bulldog. I feel like he's got a lot of attitude. He's got these like sassy little arms. I don't know. I feel like He's lived. He's seen a lot. Look, he even has a little mustache. Do you see that? People on the internet aren't gonna like this. They're gonna be like, fish has heads? No. Okay, we're going in. Gus, this is all for a good cause. It's for our aspic jelly. It seems like it's gonna be, like when I first heard we were gonna do this, I thought it was gonna be a really difficult recipe, but it's actually not, because you just simmer a bunch of stuff together and boom, you got gelatin. It takes a little bit of time, and it takes a big pot. So we are actually pulling this recipe from the same cookbook where we found our thousand-year-old hangover cure. A dish as flavorful and balmy as the delicate fingers of the gazelle that cooked it. Its pale hue shimmers like her contour flickering through her sheer gown. I'm excited to try another recipe from there because I actually really liked that hangover stew and it also sounded kind of crazy. So maybe crazy is delicious, yeah? All right, so now we're gonna spice this up. It's not gonna just be heads. So in this little piece of cheesecloth, I'm gonna make a little bundle with all of our spices. This is actually like a really good technique that I still use all the time because a lot of these little spices can make your broth really cloudy. First up, we've got some coriander. We just cracked them a little bit right into the bundle. Now, black pepper. This is just where we're gonna put our little things. Some clove and long pepper. I really, really like long pepper, but I feel like you don't see it a lot in Western cooking. My mom said that you cannot make a meat dish 
without long pepper. When she does like any kind of lamb kebab, uh, beef braise, anything like that, she puts a little long pepper. It has like the peppery bite, but similar to Szechuan peppercorn, it leaves that little like tingly thing that I think is pretty cool. This is spike nard. This was used a lot in like the olden times. They would turn it into an essential oil, which was supposed to cure anxiety, depression, insomnia. I feel like I need to make some spike nard oil. I think we all need a little spike nard oil. Why have I not heard of this before? All right, so that's our little itty bitty spices. And these are what I'm gonna tie up. There's a little bit of fish blood on it, but it's okay. You know, it's all going into the same pot. Why, why get another cutting board? It's all joining the same party. Now we've got some parsley. I'm gonna tie this up too. We wanna try and get like a relatively clear stock so we have a really pretty jelly. So that's why we're taking the time to like bundle stuff up so it doesn't completely break down, but we still get the benefit of all the flavor. In we go. Now, a couple other things. We've got some ginger. I just cut it in half lengthwise. This is like a nice thing to do because you just get it more exposed to the water, extract more of that flavor. And galangal. Galangal's in the ginger family. It's also a rhizome, but the flavor's a little bit different. It's a little more aromatic, a little more spicy. Uh, I don't know why we don't make galangal soda. I think it'd be really good. And cassia, which is a Chinese type of cinnamon. I like to crack it just a touch. Just to, anytime I use any cinnamon sticks, I always crack it open lengthwise just to like open it up, extract more flavor. Last thing that's going in here, three whole onions. I've never put like whole onions into a broth. I always chop them up, but they specified whole. So I think this might also be to like, maybe give you just a little bit of onion flavor without getting too crazy. Sometimes I'll put like a whole chili into a dish to just get the aroma without the heat. So I'm thinking maybe we're just gonna get like a mild onion flavor, but not like that spicy onion bite. Now the last thing is a little bit of vinegar. Now the recipe wasn't like super specific with how much water, how much vinegar. A lot of these older recipes don't even tell you when there's water. So we were like, not sure, like do we top it off completely with vinegar? We decided to go with the root of just like a splash because too much acid can mess with the gelatin, but a little bit does extract it from the bones. So this is kind of like how I would make a bone broth. I always put a little bit of vinegar to help extract the collagen. So that's what we're going with. Now I'm gonna top this off with water, bring it to a gentle simmer and let it just cook until the fish heads get really nice and tender so I can pull out those lips and tongues. And earlier today, I was able to chat with Ken Albala, culinary historian, professor, and friend of the show. And he told us a little bit more about gelatin and the history of aspic. Have you ever made any kind of aspic close to what we're doing today? I have, in fact, yeah. I mean, fish bones are very easy to make aspic out of. Mm -hmm. um, you just boil them and you get a kind of glue out of the connective tissue and mm -hmm. it's very simple. And in fact, the easiest kind of aspic to make comes from uh, the sturgeon's swim bladder. That's what, what they called in Latin, ichthyocala. And it's just this little dried bit of, looks like plastic kind of, and you uh -huh. soak it in water and it makes almost instant gelatin. And that's what people used before there was gelatin. Whoa. Yeah. Wait, so you don't, you just take the bladder and you dry it and then you can just throw it into warm water and boom? Yep, exactly like that. Whoa, that's cool. So they were, they were into that instant jello game long before. That's the Middle Ages, in fact, yeah. Wow, okay. I mean, when I think about jello and stuff, the first thing that comes to mind are the 50s and 60s, but what other time periods was gelatin a really big deal? Yeah, jello comes in and out of fashion. So it's really big in the Middle Ages and early Renaissance, and then it goes really out of fashion and it comes back in the 19th century when they're, st when they're using, you know, mostly bones and boiling cartilage and pig's feet and things like that. And mm -hmm. there are these towers of gelatins because they, they finally developed molds so they could make these mm -hmm. like, elaborate, colorful things. And those went out of fashion among, in fancy restaurants at least, but that's when powdered gelatin packets started to be used in the late 19th century. And then through the 30s and 40s, the Jello company, you know, sold mm -hmm. this stuff pre-flavored and came out mm -hmm. with all these recipes for throwing everything, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> into your uh, yeah. you know? Back in the Middle Ages, did they do, you know how in the 50s you like cut out the Jello into little stars and hearts and then float it into your Jello mold? Did they do stuff like that? 
Yeah, they did. In fact, there's there's a wonderful cookbook author, Bartolomeo Scappi, who you've worked with before. Um, oh, yeah, I remember Scappi. One jar or not. So Scappi <laughs> has, has these great gelatin molds that are layered, and he tells you specifically how to keep the layers separate. And he also cuts out little stars and shapes and things. And so it, oh, wow. it fit in the 50s perfectly. Whoa, that's crazy. It's like we keep coming back to the same things. Yep, yep. And of course, it's wildly out of fashion now. So, mm-hmm. so what I've been trying to do is bring it back into fashion, <laughs> you know, with using interesting cocktail mixes and interesting ingredients. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think jello shots are out of fashion. I like those. Well, but the thing is that they're usually <laughs> made with like jello packets and cheap, yeah, yeah. cheap booze, and they're not, yeah. they don't really taste good. So I'm thinking if you use a really interesting cocktail and put in something exciting, like an oyster, you know, then yeah, good. <laughs> I feel like it could be fun to do like a Negroni, like layered. Yeah, Break out the respect. gin and the, what is in there? It's the gin, Campari, vermouth, three layers. Exactly, yep. And then boom, it's a Negroni in your mouth. So. I heard that you're writing a book all about gelatin. I am. I'm very excited about. Could you give us a preview? Yeah, it's partly history. So I'm partly going back to the origins of gelatin, why Mm -hmm. it comes in and out of fashion for social, economic, political reasons. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I'm projecting into the future, what what will this gelatin revival look like? And Mm -hmm. uh, making gelatin mostly as jello shots. Most of them have alcohol in them. (laughs) Strange ingredients. What's the craziest type of aspect that you've ever had? I've done ones that really terrified me, which was just, you know. Okay, um, go on. But the, one, the one that I that got the most sort of attention was a BLT reconstructed in a set in a martini, but there was no bread. It was just bacon and really good tomato and lettuce set into a triangle of a martini. So you ate it. It was sort of like a power lunch. That was, it was good. I thought it was really good. But for some reason, people got really, really scared at that. Um, They didn't like one that I did with an octopus because you were kind of looking up the back end of the octopus with all its Uh legs out like this, but it was set into a mold and in this little sort of orb of, of gelatin. And that was kind of scary for people. I don't think I've ever met anyone as passionate about gelatin as you are. I, I think I'm like less hesitant about tasting this. I was a little nervous at first, but like I feel a lot better. I feel like my mind is open to the world of Aspic now. Thanks so much for taking the time to like do the almost in person thing. Okay, well. We're, get, we're getting closer from like just comments on scripts. Well, anytime <laughs> you want me to come over and, and cook with you, that would be great. Oh yeah, that would be awesome. I'm super down. All right, thank you so much. And I'm gonna get back to my fish heads now. Okay, have fun. (laughs) Our fish heads have had some time to simmer. They're really nice and tender, and you can see that these lips are just ready to be ripped right off. So I'm gonna pull out the heads, and then we're gonna pull off the tongues and the lips, strain the broth, and then we're gonna add a little saffron, reduce it, and that's gonna be our jelly. All right, so let's get in here. I believe this is my friend Gus. He's given us all he's got, you know? You can take a look, it's like pretty much falling apart. There's nothing left here but those lips and tongues. We're going to get those. All right. Hello. Hello, friend. Let's see. What's the best way to do this? Turn them upright so we can be face to face. I feel like it's important to look your food in the eye, you know? No, I really like fish heads. I think it's the best part of the fish because it's very gelatinous. I love my favorite way is to split them. Or you can have your fishmonger do it for you. They could just split them right in half. And then, you know, just give it a quick dry brine with a little bit of salt, like 20 minutes, and then hit them on the grill. I think it's super delicious. So I get, like, why he digs these fish lips. I've never, like, been so baller to just eat the lips, though. Okay, so we're not going to use these bones. We just want the tender, gelatinous lips. At one point, this aspic was made for the famous ruler, Khalif Harun, by his brother. And it had thousands of fish lips and tongues in it and it cost 1,000 dirhams, which today would be $140,000. It's a very, very expensive aspic. Hey, hello. Look at that, came right off. And now I gotta get in there and find the tongue. Hello, how are you doing? This is like a lot of work to go in there and delicately pull these out. I really like beef tongue, like cow tongue, duck tongue, but I've never really thought to just take a moment and appreciate the fish tongue. I'm sure it's gonna be similar, maybe a bit more tender. So this recipe comes to us from Baghdad, specifically during the golden age of Islam. 
And during this time, Caliph Harun had a scientific court that would have made anyone jealous. He had Greek philosophy, science, and math translated into Arabic so his whole court could share with the knowledge. Come here, you fish head. Ugh. These are, these are big, big heads, but I think that they need to be big because, you know, on a, like a small branzino, I imagine the tongue is just tiny, right? So these fish heads, at this point, they've completely like given up all their flavor and all their um, goodness to the broth. So after we get the lips and tongues, we're gonna discard the heads. The meat at this point is gonna be really, really dry, but all of that flavor is in the liquid. This is where the gold is right now. I don't know why the idea of this like freaks me out because I do like fish collars. That's delicious. All the fancy restaurants are all about that. Fish cheeks, you gotta pay a lot of money for that. Why not the tongue? We've got our heads, we've got our fish tongues, we've got our lips. Now I'm gonna strain this broth. We wanna get rid of the rest of those little bits and bobs and then we're gonna simmer this down to like really concentrate the gelatin and collagen so we get a really nice set aspect. So. We've gotten a lot of use out of this ancient colander. So in the 1930s, aspic jelly started to become popular because you need a fridge to cool it down. And not everyone had a fridge, so it was kind of a sign that you were of a certain income level. That's how people showed off back then. Look at my aspic. I am strong. I do yoga. Ooh! It's not fishy, not at all. It smells really clean. That fish was very fresh. They only get the best stuff around here. But by 1944, 85% of Americans had a fridge. So aspic jellies went from being something for the elite to something for everyone. Okay, so let's move our solids out of the way. If you live in an area with a lot of stray cats, I'm sure they'll be visiting you if you make something like this. This is a, a little reminiscent of garum. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Now I feel like I'm really getting the aroma. <laughs> okay, so now my fish stock is gonna reduce. We're gonna add some saffron to it. And I'm also gonna put those fish tongues and lips in it at this point. Hello guys, welcome back. Okay, so the recipe said to add a good amount of saffron. We wanna see the color of the saffron. So I went for like a lot. It's very expensive. Like each saffron thread is like from one flower that's handpicked. It's really, really pricey. I believe that it's more expensive than gold, so I'm really stingy with it. So this is gonna add a really nice deep golden color. You know you've got the real stuff when it gives you that like deep golden hue. I'm just like gently crushing it between my fingers, and then I'm gonna add a little bit of this fish stock to help it bloom. Whenever you use saffron, you usually make like a saffron tea first. Some people just steep the threads in a little bit of water. I've also seen milk, my mom does milk. Um, and then other people grind the saffron into a powder with some sugar or salt to like give it a little grit. And then you steep it to make a little bit of a tea and then you add it to whatever you're cooking. So while my saffron has a sec to steep, I'm gonna add my fish tongues and fish lips back to this broth. I get why he wanted thousands of tongues because after seeing all those heads turn into just a few tongues, it doesn't look like a whole lot. Now we're gonna add our saffron. You can see that just from having a second with that hot liquid, the liquid has become like this really deep orange color. I think that's the most saffron I've ever used in one time. I use like, like six threads at a time. I told you, I'm stingy with it. You should see me with vanilla. All right, so we're gonna let this simmer, reduce by half, and then finally we're gonna set it into a dish and hopefully it becomes jiggly. All right, so our stock has been simmering away. It has reduced by a lot. The color is super rich and golden, and those fish tongues are really nice and tender. And now we're gonna pour it into our mold, or bowl, that we're gonna be serving it out of. So aspic jellies in the 1930s, they were actually called gelatin salads. And the Jello company made instant Jello flavors that were supposed to be perfect for your gelatin salad. They had flavors like mixed vegetable, seasoned tomato, Celery, an Italian blend. It was supposed to go really well with the meat, vegetables, and fish you're putting in there. I wonder if they had saffron. Okay, in go our tongues. Whoop. And now we're gonna let this set and hopefully it gets like really nice and wiggly and jiggly. At this point, 
It just smells really good. I mostly am just getting saffron, not like a ton of fishiness as I was expecting. Okay, so now we're gonna set this aside to cool and hope it sets. I don't really know if it's gonna set. I've never made a gelatin like this with fish. So I guess we're all gonna find out together. Fingers crossed. It's time. There's no more Stalin. We've got our ancient aspic made out of fish heads with the fish tongues and the fish lips suspended in it. It's set firm. Like, I wasn't expecting it to be so firm. And then here's our, I guess it's mid-century modern, right? Our jello mold, the classic. This is the one that I've always thought about. This one has lemon jello. Into that, we've added some tuna, hard boiled egg, celery, onion, mayonnaise, and then whipped cream was folded into it. And then all the way at the bottom is a little bit of tomato juice set with more lemon jello. Because of course, I've actually never had a savory jello like this. So I'm excited. I'm a little concerned, you know? Even Ken is like the biggest gelatin fan I've ever met, and he called the mid-century ones dreadful. So I don't have like the highest hopes here, but I think, I think this is gonna be good because even though it was just a whole bunch of fish heads, it actually smells really good. The first thing that I smell is saffron. First thing that you see is saffron. There's so much saffron in here, it's like a deep, deep orange. Now, back then, they wouldn't have unmolded it like this. They didn't have molds like that, so it's just like a scoop and serve. So I'm gonna go in and get in there. I'm gonna make sure I get a tongue. I gotta get a tongue, I gotta get a, wow. Whoa. Wow. Okay, that's kind of pretty. It's really nicely set, really nice color. It's like a sunset made of fish heads. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. Wait, a few things just happened right there. Hold on, hold on. Okay. First of all, the texture is really nice. Really, really nice. It just melts in your mouth. It's not like J-E-L-L-O -L -L Jello. You know what I mean? It immediately dissolves, I think, because it's fish instead of pork. This is pork, so it's like really tender, and it's a lot like, uh, it almost feels like a sauce. You know, it just goes in your mouth, melts away. I don't get any fishiness, but what I do get is a slight metallic aftertaste from the saffron. Maybe we overdid it. <laughs> we might have. Hmm, this is not bad. It's not, it's not like crazy fishy at all. The, the fish tongue is like, has this really rich, like silky texture that is really enjoyable. Um, the aspic just feels like really savory and rich, but not like specifically fishy. The main thing I'm getting is like ginger and saffron, maybe a little bit too much. It's like very punchy on the back end, but the texture's a lot nicer than I was expecting. Flavor's a lot nicer than I was expecting. I think it, it's just like having a cold soup. You know what I mean? I, I think I would prefer it hot, but like, it's just like having really cold, really good bone broth, just like cold. It wasn't bad. I, don't, I wouldn't spend 140,000 on it though. That seems extreme. Now, we are gonna try and unmold it because it's set so firm. I don't think any of us were expecting it to be like this perfect and bouncy. Like, look at that. You could like bounce a ball off of that. Thank you, Gif. You should have had a fish costume. Hot towel, and hopefully we just get a kerplunk. Oh God. No, that didn't work. Heat gun. It's probably gonna work a little bit better. Oh, okay, that works. Now that bowl's gonna be really hot, so. Big reveal. Whoa. All right. It unmolded. Look at that. So if you get in there, you can actually see the little fish mouths. That's Gus right there. He's still smiling after all he's been through. Look at all those smiley faces. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, I think eight's right there. There's eight, wiggling. It's a nice jiggle. Okay, this, this, I was really scared of this, but it's actually, it's pretty delicious. 
you know, it's just like not a familiar texture for me. I'm not used to like savory gels, but I get like if you come from a culture and a culinary perspective that's into it, this is actually a very tasty savory gel. Now we're going to move on to a more questionable savory gel. So let's get into here. It is firm. So in the 1950s, was this like an appetizer or an entree? Does anyone out there still make stuff like this? Do you have a jello salad that's like a family favorite that you think we should try? Let me know. Maybe we'll do this again. There's so much aspic out there. Okay, wiggle, wiggle. All right, let's get in there. Look at that tuna. Tuna, tomato, I'm getting every layer. Cream, even a bite of celery. We're doing it all. That's not terrible. Okay. I really wasn't looking forward to this, but it's fine. It's fine. It's not bad. It just tastes like, it just tastes like a really creamy tuna salad with a hint of sweetness that somehow is a little gelatinous. <laughs> no, but it's not bad. It's not bad. It's really not. Hmm. It's not terrible, but I would not make this again. No. Is there a jello that you like? I think I grew up with the jigglers, so I'm surprised by how tender this is. This is similar to this one. It just kind of like melts in your mouth. You don't get a lot of fishiness from the tuna. It all just kind of works together. And um, yeah, this was cool. I've actually always wanted to try these, but like I've never had an occasion to make a tuna jello mold. So I'm so glad that you guys let me do this. If you like this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. And if there's an ancient or vintage recipe or just something that you think can top this aspic, let me know in the comments and I'll see you next time.